There. How does that look? Now I can hear myself. I didn't, I didn't know whether I was talking or not. Now I can hear. So this is confirmation, and I'm going to give you a, an overview of the Episcopal tradition or the Anglican tradition. And I have a talk that I've done uh, many years with lots of variations called The Angles of Anglicanism. The Angles of Anglicanism. Because for me, uh, Anglicanism is about various angles. When I say Anglicanism, I'm talking about the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church has its roots in the Anglican tradition of Christianity. That is, it came from England. We're not English, but we have that in our history. But I'm going to start with, as Keith said, uh, a kind of basis in the Bible. And um, I'll, just, I'll just go ahead and start. You, you can ask me a question any time during the thing. There are only, if, you, if I were in charge of grading this confirmation class, you would only have to answer two questions correctly. But I'm not in charge, so Keith's in charge and Lauren's in charge. The, the first question you have to answer correctly is this one. <clears throat> Who started the Episcopal Church? We have some eager answers here. Jesus. Jesus. He's, she's been through the class before. The main thing you have to say is who did not start the Episcopal Church. Henry VIII did not start the Episcopal Church. Can everybody repeat that after me? Henry VIII did not start the Episcopal Church. Okay, you're halfway there. Now, this is a, now here's a, even a, a harder question. And I'll have to see this one. The, the second point is this. The Episcopal Church is not the via media. Ooh, that's a weird one. Via media means middle way. A lot of people think that the, the Episcopal Church is kind of middle way, middle way between the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. But my presentation is not that the Episcopal Church is the middle way. We are not the via media. We are the via comprehensiva. That is, we are wide enough to be on the left and on the right, the Protestant and the Roman Catholic. So that's another phrase you have to get right to pass my confirmation class. Via comprehensiva. Can anybody say that? Via comprehensiva. You guys have passed. We can go home now. The Episcopal Church is not the via media. It is the via comprehensiva. Jesus Christ started the church, not Henry VIII. The Episcopal Church is the via comprehensiva, the comprehensive way, not the middle way. The middle way is kind of a wimpy way. It's kind of, kind of winds its way through the middle. That They say the problem about driving down the middle of the road is you get hit by traffic coming from two different directions. It's better to take the whole road, be the whole thing. So let's start with two more, two more things. Um, and I know some of you have a history in the church. Some of you may not have a history in the church, uh, especially uh, adults. And so I want to start from the beginning, not just the Anglican tradition, but Christianity in general. The Episcopal Church, and when I say the Episcopal Church, I mean Anglicanism. The Episcopal Church <clears throat> is generous and biblical. The Episcopal Church is generous and biblical. Generous meaning... We're broad. We can accept the gospel from a lot of different angles. We sense the Spirit of God from a lot of different places. We are generous that way. Secondly, however, the Episcopal Church is biblical. We like the Bible. One of the things that I enjoy most in my ministry is teaching the Bible. The Bible really uh, puts our tradition out there, but not the way a lot of people think it does. For instance, here's the next, all these other questions are not uh, for the test, okay? I'm just, when I ask questions, you're no longer uh, taking a test. You've answered the first two questions correctly. You pass. Henry VIII did not start the Episcopal Church, and the Episcopal Church is the via comprehensiva, the comprehensive way, not the middle way. But here is a little trickier question. 
according to the Bible, who was created first, animals or human beings? Ryan, you got your hands up. Who? Uh, man. Man, what do you say? Animals, what do you say? Animals, any other, any other possibilities? Yeah, animals. Both. We have somebody who's been to the class before. A according to the Bible, both answers are correct. It depends on whether you read Genesis 1. I'll remind you what Genesis 1 said. Remember when Genesis 1, in the beginning, when all was chaos, God created light and it was good. God created day, it was good. The sun, the moon, the plants. And then on the fifth day, God created animals, right? And then the next day was what? Adam and Eve, right? That's according to Genesis chapter 1. But then in the very second book of the Bible, the Bible says this. God created Adam and then created all the animals as a helpmeet for Adam. Remember that? We don't often think of that being contradictory, but it's there. God created the animals so that Adam could have a companion, remember? And it, it'll come back to you. You've never compared them. But in Genesis 2, the, uh, there wasn't a helper for Adam among all the animals. And therefore, God created um, Eve, uh, you know, out of, out of Adam. The reason for that is Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are written by two different authors, the Episcopal Church believes that God surely inspired the Bible, but it is a collection of books and a collection of different opinions and a collection of different stories. You can see this quite obviously, as I've just demonstrated, in the very first two chapters of the Bible. It doesn't mean they're contradictory and you throw the whole Bible out. It just means you've got to think when you read the Bible. They are different stories about very important events. It's like being at your family Thanksgiving dinner. How many of you have had a big family dinner? When your mother and father are there, maybe your cousins, your uncle and aunt, maybe a lot of people. And uh, Uncle Joe reminds you of one of your family stories. Remember that time we did this, this, this? And everybody says, oh, that was great. But then Aunt Matilda says what? She says, no, no, it didn't happen like that. It didn't happen like that at all. It happened like this. Well, that's a family story. The Bible is our family story. The stories we have in the Bible don't always correspond exactly. They are different writers, different people, very faithful, very committed, who add their own sense to it. And this goes on and on. The stories of Moses sometimes have two different versions. The story of David, King David, he has one set of stories in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, and then First and Second Chronicles comes along and tells it from a whole different perspective, a whole different perspective. Finally, you have what happened to our our Lord and Savior Jesus. He was teaching one day, and all the disciples were bickering and talking in the back, and Jesus said, be quiet, be quiet, I'm talking. When I'm, uh, when I'm gone, I don't want you all to have four different versions of the same story. But of course, we do have four different versions of the same story. The Gospels in the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are very faithful. They tell us about Jesus, but they're not the same story. They don't have the same ingredients. One is from Matthew's point of view. One is from Luke's point of view. One is from Uncle Joe's point of view. And one is from Aunt Matilda's point of view. So the Episcopal Church believes the Bible, but we take the Bible seriously. We take the Bible seriously. And we see that the Bible itself has experienced God from so many places, starting with Adam and Eve, going through Abraham. Abraham 
is blessed by God in chapter 12 of Genesis. And God says to Abraham, I will bless you and in you I will bless many nations. Abraham, the father of faith, becomes the blessing of everybody who has faith. In Genesis 15, it says that Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness because he was in relationship with God. And that faith goes down through the generations. In the Psalms, we hear that in Psalm 19, that the heavens declare the glory of God, which is to say, God comes through people, Adam and Eve. God comes through relationships like with Adam, but God also comes in the stars and in the world, in the creation around us. These are the things the Bible talks about. The Episcopal Church takes all those different angles. We understand that God speaks to us from different angles because the Bible is an indication of that. The Bible provides evidence of those various angles. Finally, um, a couple of other verses I just want to start with. The, um, one of my favorite ones is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And you hear a lot about, um, let's call it, let's call it, some people call it original sin, but I call it inevitable sin. That our humanity is, is built on something that we all make mistakes. We all fall short. But that doesn't mean we're all bad. God is good, and God creates the world to be good. God has created humanity to be good. 1 Corinthians 15 says, As in Adam all sin, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So the Episcopal Church believes, yeah, we all fall short. And if we all participate in that because we're all human, we also all participate all participate in the salvation of Christ. If everybody has fallen through Adam, it's just as true and just as broad that everybody is raised in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, as in Adam all sin, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So we're trying to bring people alive and all people alive. Finally, According to the Bible, Colossians 1 in particular, Christ is that image of God. The Episcopal Church believes that Christ is the icon of God, the image of God, before all things and in him all things hold together. That is Jesus. But we see Jesus. The Episcopal Church senses Jesus, experiences the Christ from lots of different angles, okay? So the Bible is a rich resource that tells us how God is being experienced in lots of different ways, from relationships, from the faith of Abraham, to the stars and the Psalms, and finally to this all-inclusive Jesus Christ. This is, what, this is how the Bible um, presents experiences of God. So you and I, no matter how long we've been coming to church or how long we've been not coming to church, we have experiences of the holy. We have experiences of God that are good for each other. They're good for each other. It's the way we come together. Um, the Episcopal Church believes in the Bible, but we also take flesh seriously. We take flesh Seriously. You know what flesh is? The body. Incarnation. Incarnation means becoming flesh. And so we like to do outreach. We like to do mission because it takes people seriously. We like to have parties because it takes people seriously. We like to have communion in church because in that sacrament, when we bless the bread and the wine, we experience the body of Christ, the body and blood of Christ. So as we go through the history of the church, the Christian church, 
um, I want to take us th through a quick summary of what our tradition has brought us coming today, the angles of Anglicanism. Jesus Christ started the church, and everything was so hunky-dory and wonderful that everybody lived happily ever after, right? No. No. Especially in the first century. As soon as the church started, there were arguments. There were conflicts. And the biggest conflict was between the two head guys of the church. Who, were the, who would you say might be the two most uh, important apostles in the New Testament outside of Jesus? Any guesses? Peter. Peter, Peter's one. Peter's the one who jumped out of the boat and tried to walk on the water. And then he, Jesus said, you're a rock. And so he, since he was a rock, he started sinking in the water. No, um, Peter's one. Who was the other big apostle in the New Testament? Paul. Did somebody say Paul? You got it. Peter and Paul. Paul wasn't around when Jesus was walking around. Paul came later. So it's not, we're not sure he was really with Jesus uh, during Jesus' ministry. But Peter was the primary of the 12 apostles, given that title. Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, uh, was a kind of an apostle to the Gentiles. Peter more an apostle from the Jewish tradition, though Paul was Jewish. They were the, probably the two primary, primary apostles, and they were the first two who had an argument. Because Peter said, in order to be a Christian, you've still got to follow the old law. You've got to follow the Jewish traditions, how to eat right, how to wash right. You've got to follow these traditions. Paul said... You don't have to follow the old law. Uh, when you come to know Christ, when you come to know Jesus, the old law is gone. You're saved by faith, not by works. And so Paul called out Peter one day. This is in Acts chapter 15 and Galatians chapter 2. Um, Paul got upset because Peter was acting one way when the Gentiles were there, but acting another way when the Jews were there. And Paul says he told him to his face to straighten up. They, um, they didn't always get, get along. Peter came along, and suddenly people realized, through Paul especially, that Christianity was not just a Jewish renewal movement. It really, the first Christians were all Jews. It was a renewal movement within Judaism. But Paul realizes that this beautiful spirit of God, this incredible presence of grace, salvation, was bigger than any one tradition, bigger than any one tribe, bigger than Judaism of the time. And that's one of Paul's geniuses, that um, the spirit of Christ, even today, is bigger than any one way of talking about Christ. We have our way of talking about Christ, but we also believe that God is bigger, and Christ is bigger. So the Anglican tradition that I'm proud to be a part of, the Episcopal Church of the United States, is a broad tradition. We see the grace of God coming from lots of different angles, as evidenced in the first argument of Christian history, Paul and Peter. Christianity, Anglican Christianity, can be Jewish, and it can also be Gentile. So lots of churches developed, and um, there were four main uh, centers of Christianity in those days. One was Jerusalem, one was Antioch in Syria, one was Alexandria in Egypt. And guess where the fourth was? Yeah, in the back. What do you say? The Pope? You got it. You guys about right. The Pope who lived in Rome, exactly. Rome was the uh, fourth center. And Rome became important because the Roman Empire was important. It's like if you have a church in New York, that church is going to be uh, more powerful than the church in Noonan, Georgia, where I grew up. It's a great church, but it's not New York. So Ro the Roman church got to be more and more powerful because that's where the, the center of commerce and, and, and um, government and such uh, was going on. However, 
uh, and, and so the, the priest, that is to say the bishop in Rome, got more respect because he had more kind of oversight. And so gradually the bishop in Rome kind of rose up in prestige. But there, was plenty of other, there were plenty of other Christians in other places and in places that were not Roman as well, especially this, look, this place way out on the outskirts of the Roman Empire, this place called the British Isles. If you look at a map, you'll see the Roman Empire based in Rome, basically all around the Mediterranean Sea. But our tradition of Christianity was never really connected to Rome because Rome was a hinterland. Uh, no disrespect to Noonan, but, well, but the British Isles was, was Noonan. In fact, the British Isles was Sharpsburg. That's really where I grew up. It's a little bitty town out, outside of Noonan. Nobody cared about that. But a lot of Christians were going out there, missionaries were going out there. One day, the Pope in Rome, Pope Gregory, saw the slave market, and he saw these young boys on the slave market. He asked a friend, one of his associates, who are these people? And uh, the reply was, they are Angles, which is to say they were from Angland. That's what the word England comes for. They were part of the Anglin, Angle tribe. That's where we get the phrase Anglo-Saxon. They were Angles. And the Pope said, non Anglis said Angelis. He spoke Latin. And so he said, not angles, but angels. They're not angles, they're angels. And so Pope Gregory decided to send a missionary to start the missionary uh, uh, trip to, to this far place where the Angles lived, England. So he sent the first Archbishop of Canterbury in 597 AD over to England. And the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, sent by the Pope, gets there. And what does he find? They're already Christians in England. They were already Christians in the British Isles. But they just weren't part of the formal Roman system. In fact, you know by name who some of these Christians were. If you think about somebody like the patron saint of Ireland, who would that be? Any, any Irish people here? Patrick, exactly. Patrick was in the fourth century, in the fifth century. He got there, he evangelized Ireland before the Archbishop of Canterbury arrived. Who is the patron saint of Wales? David, that's right. Saint David is the patron saint of Wales. And then one of the, my favorites, Saint Columba, who started a monastery up with the Picts up in Iona. All those very famous monks predated the first Archbishop of Canterbury. They're the ones who developed Christianity in England before the Roman Catholic system arrived. And the Christianity that they um, developed and grew from was what we call a Celtic Christianity, C-E-L-T-I-C, a -E uh, Christianity that is very close to the earth, that's very close to the stars and, the, and nature and trees. They, Saint Columba even called Christ a druid. He wanted to translate the uh, Christ word to the local languages. So he would say, Christ is my druid, said St. Columba. So the Celtic Christians didn't have all this administrative system that the Roman Catholic system had. The Celtic Christians were more monastic and they were more uh, wanderers. They didn't have dioceses and, and all the administrative structure. Uh, and they also had different dates for Easter, they had different customs. Well, the king and queen of England in the early 600s had a problem because at one point, one of them was a Roman Christian and one was a Celtic Christian. And so in 664, they went to one of the monasteries, the one that was run by a woman, Hilda of Whitby, had the, uh, oversaw the Senate of Whitby, where they decided, should our English Christianity follow the Roman church or should it follow the Celtic tradition? 
They decided to go with the Roman church because they felt like it was older, but that Celtic influence continued to be part of our tradition. So the Anglican church is both Roman and Celtic. We have a system that goes back to the early Rome church, but we also have theology and belief that is close to the earth, that's close to nature, the, the Celtic system of Christianity. You with me there, that, on that? So Christianity in England continues, and it got, you know, England got wiped out in the 7th and 8th century, and it came back in the 9th and 10th century. And then in 1066, anybody uh, know your English history? You know what one of the great dates are? Hold on, we've got a timeout for a new thing. Perfect, perfect. Okay, good. Anybody know one of the great dates in, in English history and what happened in the year 1066? Got the same hands. What, what happened? William the Conqueror. William the Conqueror. You guys know your history. William the Conqueror comes in in, in the Battle of Hastings. And William the Conqueror, where was he from? No, almost. Normandy. Normandy. And where is Normandy? France. He's French. It's William the Conqueror who comes in from Normandy and brings a whole different language to England. The Anglo-Saxon language was very guttural, one syllable. And the French language has all of these syllables and very melodic. And, but William the Conqueror wanted to be in charge of the church. It's William the Conqueror, like a lot of kings did. When they took over a country, they were going to be the head of the church, not just the head of the state, but the head of the church. So when we say things like Henry VIII wanted to be the head of the church, and that's what broke off um, England from Rome, we're 400 years too late. William the Conqueror had already done that in 1066. He had said, I'm going to be head of the church. I'm going to appoint bishops. I'm going to call councils. So there became a conflict between the kings of England and the pope over in Rome. And for centuries, the king of England would not let the Roman pope send an archbishop of Canterbury to England. The Roman uh, popes would get as far as Normandy, and they couldn't get across. And then one day, uh, I think it's Henry II, gets word that um, this new Archbishop of Canterbury is coming over across the channel, and uh, the King of England says, will no one rid me of this meddlesome priest? And what happened then? The priest came over, and he was murdered in the cathedral. His name was Thomas a Becket. Many of us know that name, but the reason he was murdered in his own cathedral is because the king of England did not want Roman priests coming over to England. They didn't want foreigners. The Rome represented a foreign power. So there's 400 years that the, Rome, the English kings don't want the Roman popes to even be in England. It's got a long history. Um, so the English church, we have some Roman uh, uh, um, connection, but we also have local collection, co uh, connection. We know, what is, we know it's important to be connected uh, to a, to a um, wider authority, but we also enjoy a connection to a local authority. So let's come to um, Henry VIII. By the time Henry VIII uh, occurs, when he's alive, let's say the early 1500s, <clears throat> the Protestant Reformation has begun. And there are lots of folks who want to throw off the old bondage of the Roman system. People like Martin Luther, people like uh, John Calvin. They wanted to stress the, um, the uh, experience of God in the individual. You don't really need a priest, some would say. Uh, Christ can be present in our own individual faith. So that's what a lot of the Protestant uh, Reformation is about. And in fact, when they 
would have communion, the Roman Catholic Church would say, Jesus Christ is present in the blessed bread, in that local bread, right? Now, that that doesn't, that they don't believe this now to such a degree. The Protestants say, no, when you come together, it's not that Jesus is present in the bread. Jesus is present in the people, in the faith. If we gather together, that's where Christ is present, not in this little piece of bread. That was one of the many arguments. Well, um, so that's in the background. As Henry VIII is trying to decide uh, how to continue his kingdom, he had been requested, some would say forced, to marry the wife of his deceased brother. He had an older brother named Arthur. Arthur died when Henry was 12 years old, and the marriage was a marriage of political convenience. Arthur was meant to marry Catherine of Aragon so that Spain and England could be connected and uh, could have a political alliance. Well, then Arthur died, and the king said, well, Arthur died. Let's have the wife be uh, Henry's wife now. So Henry said, okay. But then Henry couldn't have any male children, and this began to bother uh, Henry. And um, uh, there had been a woman queen of England before, but it had not gone well. And so Henry got more and more disturbed, and of course, he also had a friend on the side, but he, but he uh, was trying to figure out what's, what's good for the kingdom. The, 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 the process was called Leverite marriage. It's from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5. Remember, the Episcopal Church is a biblical church. Deuteronomy 25, 5 says, if a brother dies, his brother should take the brother's wife. That's in the Bible. The Bible said it, so that's what they were following. But then Henry uh, couldn't have a male heir. He had several wives and then some more wives. And finally, he asked the Pope for an, an annulment from Catherine of Aragon. The Pope wouldn't do that. And the Pope didn't do it because the Roman emperor at the time was the Pope's Nef was the nephew of Catherine of Aragon. I'm getting this. In other words, the Pope did not want to offend the Queen of England, Catherine of Aragon, but, uh, so he was not going to give her an annulment from Henry, who wanted the annulment. This is, this is complicated. Welcome to church uh, politics. So Henry has some Protestant uh, friends, Thomas Cranmer won them, who said, you know what? There's another verse in the Bible, not Deuteronomy, 25, 5, but Leviticus chapter 20, verse 21. If a man uncovers the nakedness of his brother's wife, it is an abomination and they shall be childless. Wow, said Henry, that's the reason. That's the reason I can't have a male heir. I've, I've gone against the Bible. We had two conflicting Bible verses. And so Henry says with his archbishop of Can his appointed archbishop of Canterbury, I don't need an annulment from the Roman Pope. I can just declare my own archbishop of Canterbury, my own church authority, and that person can give me an annulment. So once Henry declared his own archbishop of Canterbury, Rome was gone. Rome, the foreign power, was no longer in England. Henry VIII was still, in his theology, very Roman Catholic. He still believed in the seven sacraments. He had written a big treaty. He'd written a big book against Martin Luther in 1521 called Assertio Septum Sacramentum. I assert seven sacraments. But he broke politically from Rome in order to get the annulment and to marry the person that he chose. This is, there's a lot more detail to this that I'll go into later. But the, the point is, Henry VIII did not start the Episcopal Church. He was always Rome, Roman in his uh, theology, but he broke from the political organization of the Roman Church. In fact, you'll hear me say sometimes that um, 
the Episcopal Church is Catholic. We are Anglican Catholic, and our friends in the Roman Church are Roman Catholic, because we're all Catholic. When we say the Nicene Creed, we say we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Catholic means universal. Christians have connections no matter what our heritage is, is, but we're kind of the English Catholics. The Romans are the Roman Catholics. You could say the Lutherans are the German Catholics. You could say the Presbyterians are the Scottish Catholics. You could say the Baptist are the American Catholics. They're all, we're all Catholic. We all have Christian, but our heritage, our country, and our culture governs some of the ways we um, interpret Christianity. So I won't go over the details because we're, mis we're about to run out of time, but after Henry, Mary took over the throne. She was Bloody Mary. She killed a lot of the Protestant reformers. After Henry, Edward VI took over the throne. He only lasted three years or so. Then Queen Mary, Bloody Mary. And then in 1559, there's one person, a human being, who might qualify for starting the Anglican church if it's not Henry. And if it's not Jesus, we all got the right answer. It's Jesus who started the church. But if there's one human being who was responsible for, the, for describing the breadth and the comprehensive nature of the Anglican church, it was Queen Elizabeth in 1559. She was a brilliant person, brilliant leader. She ruled for over 40 years. She was wise in her own right. She was a theologian herself. And so when the time came to put some of the prayer book together, it was her idea to use pieces of the Roman prayer book and the Protestant prayer book in one book that would be the Book of Common Prayer. It'd be the third Book of Common Prayer in the Church of England. For instance, the Roman Catholic Church at the time, when they gave people communion, they would say, this is the body of Christ. You know what uh, the Latin is for this is the body of Christ? Hoc est meus corpus. And people who wanted to make fun of the medieval mass, that is to say the medieval Eucharist, they, they, they were making fun of the kind of magical quality. All the priest had to say was that word and the bread would become body. Hoc est meus corpus. And so the magicians, to make fun, to make fun of that, turned that phrase into the magical phrase, hocus pocus. Hocus pocus comes from the Latin hoc est meus corpus. When people were making fun of the Roman church, they thought, they claimed, the, the ardent ones would, that in that one piece of bread, this is the body of Christ. The Protestants, remember, said, no, Christ is present not just, not in the bread, Christ is present in us. Christ is present in our hearts. Whenever we come together in faith, Christ is present. Well, it was Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, in 1559, who said, both are right. And so the 1559 prayer book has both sentences in it. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Take this in remembrance that Christ died for you. And Christ is present in both those circumstances. Well, that breadth and that comprehensiveness is part of our tradition. That's where we come from as Christians in the Episcopal Church. So jumping, uh, I'm not going to have enough time, Mr. Keith. I'll have to come back again. Yeah. Um, jumping, jumping forward some time to the United States. When um, the priest in the United States of the Church of England, they were all ordained by a foreign country. And not just a foreign country, but a country that the colonizers, uh, the, the colony people were at war with, right? And so the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church, the Church of England, didn't do so well in the Revolutionary War. But there were people who wanted to continue the tradition. They just weren't allowed to be ordained in the Church of England because at the time, in order to be ordained in the Church of England, you had to make uh, allegiance, make a vow, to the king. You had to say, I'm going to follow the king. It's part of the church state or relationship in England. I won't go through all the details of that, 
But that's where, because of that delay, let's say 10, 20 year delay, the Episcopal Church um, had some people who were following Samuel Seabury, who went over to the Church of Scotland to be ordained bishop. Some people were following a guy named William White in Philadelphia, and some people were following John Wesley. John Wesley was a Church of England priest, as was his brother Charles. And he was impatient about waiting for England to change its laws so that they could, you could be ordained without swearing allegiance to the uh, royalty of England. And that's why Wesley ended up laying hands on his own uh, superintendents. He said, I'm not making them bishops, I'm making them superintendents. But they sure seemed like bishops at the time, which is one of the tragedies, because the Methodist Church at its beginning was part of the Church of England. It was one of the renewal movements of the Church of England. And there, as you all know, there are lots of great Methodist traditions. Um, but it could, if we had waited a couple more years, they, we could have kept the Church of England together like that. Nevertheless, those renewal movements are certainly part of the American church. Finally, the American church gets put together. We had both bishops and lay people. So our church system is not run by bishops. Our church system, as of 1789, when we're making any kind of important decision, it's not the bishop who makes the sole decision. We meet in a general convention that has a house of bishops, all those who have been consecrated bishop, and also a house of deputies. Deputies are priests and lay people elected from their home diocese. So anytime we're gonna change the prayer book or make a certain uh, uh, regulation or, or um, resolution, the same resolution has to pass the house of bishops and the house of deputies. Our system in the Episcopal, that's when we were first called the Episcopal Church, the Protestant Episcopal Church of the United States of America. That was our first name. It was really called the Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society, DFMS, but it's really the Protestant Episcopal Church. We've dropped the word Protestant now and we're now just known as the Episcopal Church. But at our beginning, we were a way to be both Protestant and have bishops. The word Episcopal means bishop. E-P-I means over, and S-C-O-P-O-S, scopus, means scope, like a telescope. So an episcopus is an overseer. That's what the word bishop means, and that's part of our heritage. The word Episcopal means we have bishops. But what we are is a Protestant church that has bishops. So going further, as the world grows and people start discovering evolution and science, this was a real threat to a lot of folks who thought that only the Bible provided scientific information. It's the Episcopal Church who was able to see the truth of God in science and to see the truth of God. There were other beside the Episcopal Church, but it's certainly part of our culture, that um, we're not afraid of discoveries in psychology, science, physics, evolution, because all truth is God's truth. If it's true, it's part of God, whether it comes from the Bible or whether it comes from physics. And so when we were worried with things like um, well, Jungian psychology and Darwin in the 19th century with evolution. A lot of times it was the Church of England people and the Episcopal people who were able to say that our faith includes reason. We believe in faith and reason. The Episcopal Church over time then has been able to say we're Jewish and Gentile. We're Roman and Celtic. We are church and state. We are Roman and Protestant. We are faith and reason. We're not the middle way that goes in between all that. We are the comprehensive way, the via comprehensiva. And so even now, um, you'll have, go to Episcopal churches and some Episcopal churches have a very high 
um, regard for liturgy, you know, incense and lots of vestments and stained glass, sort of like what we do here. But other Episcopal churches don't even have stained glass, don't even have incense. Um, they're they're going to be part of the, the low church system. You have a high church, which believes in a lot of ceremony, and a low church that believes that wants to hear more of the Bible, more of the preaching, more of the sermon. Um, but both are valid Episcopal expressions of Christianity. I'll stop since our, my time is up, but that's, the, that's what gets us to today. The Episcopal Church is a broad and generous Christianity because the Bible is a broad and generous story. Lots of different authors all telling us about the love of God, all telling us about the grace of Jesus Christ. Henry VIII did not start the Episcopal Church. Jesus did in his grace and in his breath. And the Episcopal Church is not the middle way between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism. We are the comprehensive way, the via comprehensiva. Let us bless the Lord. Thank you. Do we have time for questions here? We're going to break into small groups. Haven. So that's a very good question. Um, the present use of the word Anglican in some of our neighbors around here in the United States is from, let's call them the renegades. I would call them, they, they most of the time were part of the Episcopal Church until 30 years ago, but they did not agree with the Episcopal Church's decision to uh, ordain women as priests, and they did not ordain with our decision to bless same-sex unions. And so they tried to claim that they were the Anglicans, not the Episcopalians. There's no copyright on the word Anglican, just like there's no copyright on the word Christian. When you go to somebody and they say, oh, you're a Christian, you believe so-and-so, and you say, no, I don't believe that. that that's not my kind of Christianity. The same way with, with Anglicanism. So there are some movements now who, who call themselves Anglican churches, but they're not part of the Episcopal Church, which is the one denomination in the U.S. that has a connection with the Archbishop of Canterbury. So we, we still are recognized by the Archbishop of Canterbury as part of the Anglican tradition. The local churches that call themselves Anglican are not recognized by the Archbishop of Canterbury. They don't like to hear me say that, but it's true. They, they wanted to claim that title because they did not agree with the ordination of women. They did not agree with, uh, with, with same-sex unions and kind of wanted to go back to a more traditional conservative place. But, our, but I believe the true Anglican expression is what I just outlined, a very broad, generous Christianity. That certainly, uh, the ordination of women is a very good example. We believe the Bible. So some of the Bible, one verse in the Bible says, women should be silent in the churches. That's in the Bible. But another verse says, in Christ there is no male or female. We believe that there are some parts of the Bible that are more important than other parts. And the reason we believe that it's because Jesus believes it. When they asked Jesus one day, what is the most important commandment in the Bible? Jesus did not say, oh, they're all equally important. They're all equally valid. Jesus didn't say that. What did he say? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. These are the two most important. The other verses are not so important. 
So you can look at some verses and find a lot of Bible verses that seem to say one thing or another, but you've got to look at the bigger picture, the broader picture. There is a certain, even Jesus says there's some verses that are more important than others. So that's a long answer to a very simple question. (laughs) Other questions? You'll have some to bring up in your small groups, and I'll let Keith direct us. Thank you, Keith.